I consider the creation of the executive branch of the Constitution one of the two or three really inventions at the Constitutional Convention. Um, it's an interesting article. If you look at Article I, the legislative article, it's long, it's detailed, it talks a long list of powers, limitations on powers, etc. Uh, article II is very short when you think about it. And it starts out with the phrase, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. That in and of itself represents an important aspect of executive power in that the framers of the Constitution had an understanding of what an executive does or should do. And so it's not just a statement, it's a vesting of power in an individual. The president has certain powers that come along with the idea of the executive function. He is the chief enforcer of the laws, the chief implementer of the laws. He is also the primary foreign policy actor under the Constitution in that he appoints ambassadors uh, subject to con uh, confirmation by the Senate. He makes treaties with other nations subject to ratification with the Senate. So he's a, he's a major actor in the implementation and frankly in making the Constitution work. There are several methods by which the delegates to the Constitutional Convention constrain the presidency. Um, I think perhaps chief among them was the power of impeachment because uh, ultimately the president can be removed. I mean, the House votes to impeach, which of course simply means accuses the president by adopting articles of impeachment rather like an indictment. Uh, if they do that, and they've done that in our history, I believe twice, um, then there is a trial and the trial is in the Senate and the Senate then specifically tries the president on those articles of impeachment and can remove the president from office. That's the most direct limitation by another branch of government. Of course, there's the implicit limitation that there are four-year terms and, of course, subsequently amended to, uh, the Constitution has been amended to limit that even further to only two four-year terms. Beyond that, there's the uh, specific delegation to the Congress for declarations of war. There's the limitation on the, the president's ability to um, have treaties with other nations. That's a very important part of the executive power, the power over foreign affairs. And yet the ultimate expression of the foreign affairs power is you know, formal agreements with other countries, and that requires the consent of the Senate. I think the modern presidency is almost impossible to imagine in 1787. Uh, first of all, the power of government has grown so much. The framers talked about a limited government of enumerated powers, a competent government that was capable of getting the job done. In the modern age, we look at the national government as a far more important force around the world than they envisioned. The executive appears to have gotten stronger as the republic has moved forward. It's not necessarily that the executive has been given additional powers. However, the executive is always in town in some respects. Congress leaves. Congress loses power. And Congress can't do anything unless it agrees with itself to do something. The executive is always there, and the executive, in some ways, has to do things. And the ability to do things requires that you be given power, and over time, that power becomes regularized. I don't think that's just the fault of the... Um uh, growth and complexity of government or a president trying to, you know, absorb power. I think Congress has abdicated a lot of responsibility to the executive by making vague laws and then leaving it to the executive branch to sort of fill in. And so uh, now we have bureaucrats who are essentially uh, making law.